All right. Um, so welcome to the inaugural episode of the Clements Bookworm. We thought it would be fun to get together and talk about um, some books that we're reading. And I just want to, it looks like everybody's doing a great job figuring out how to use chat. So we'd love to have you continue. You can choose who receives your chat. It's a lot of fun if you select all panelists and attendees so we can all see it. The conversation, however, does go by very quickly as you've been seeing. So if you have specific questions, please instead use the Q&A. That's where you can ask questions. You can see the other questions that people are asking and upvote them if it's something you're particularly interested in hearing about. And then the answers can be posted right there with the questions and they won't go away. Um, this also gives an opportunity for um, our other staff members who are participating online to help us answer some questions as well. So that's a great place to put your questions and we hope that you'll participate. And then um, we have, uh, um, we're coming to you even though we're all at home, we're all part of the Clemens Library at the University of Michigan. And the Clemens Library is um, a place that, um, where you can study primary sources in American history from early exploration up through the early 1900s. And we preserve and make available those resources to researchers, and a researcher can be anyone um, who comes to the Clements, or maybe you even use our resources online. Um, if you come to the Clements, this is what it looks like. Uh, we have this wonderful reading room, the Avenir Foundation Room, where researchers can look at our uh, materials, and then at 10 a.m. every morning, a little bell is rung and everyone is invited to Clemens Library Tea Time. This is an opportunity for researchers to get together with uh, the Clements staff, talk through their research, get more <laughs> ideas, and get to know each other and discuss the books they're reading and other um, things like that. So today we are getting together in that Spirit, coming around the tea table to have a discussion um, about our love of American history and share some of the books that we're reading. Today's panelists, um, we have Paul Erickson, uh, the Randolph T. Adams Director of the Clements Library, Sarah Kwashny, who is a reading room supervisor here at the Clements Library, and Dick Marsh, who is a member of the Clements Library Associates Board of Governors. Welcome everybody, we're so happy to have you here. Um, if you haven't had a chance yet, please take the poll and um, you'll later in, later we'll also be uh, asking you if you're interested in presenting in the future. So without Further ado, let's see, stop share, good. Um, I would like to introduce Paul Erickson and thank him for being here with us today. Paul, what are you going to talk about? So I'm gonna be talking about something that I'm actually rereading. Uh, it's not a book, it's an article. Um, called The Gothic Origins of Global Health um, by Sari Altshuler, who is a professor in English at Northeastern University. Um, uh, she's also a good friend of mine. So uh, it's a piece that I've read before and it is drawn from her recent book, um, The Medical Imagination, um, Literature and Health in the Early United States, which is really a fantastic book. It's from University of Pennsylvania Press. Uh, highly recommend it. Um, and the reason I'm, I'm reading this, rereading this article um, is that Sari and a colleague at Northeastern, another early Americanist in the English department, uh, Elizabeth Maddock-Dillon, 
have put together a crowdsourced humanities coronavirus syllabus. Um, it's a list of, of texts in early American uh, history and literature about disease and public health and epidemics that they have made freely available to faculty around the country who are having to switch their classes to online mode uh, and might want to use have some materials that are sort of uh, more topical for what we're going through right now. So that is uh, why I'm rereading it. Um, and it's a fantastic article. It's from uh, American Literature, the September 2017 issue, and I'm happy to send a PDF to anybody who wants one. Great. Um, the, we're looking forward to hearing a little bit more about this. And I know that we talked a little bit yesterday um, about, you know, how this relates to what's going on right now. Sure. Um, so one of the things that is um, a question that always comes up for, for me, and I think a lot of people who work in the humanities is, is what are the humanities good for, especially in times of crisis like this? There's a sense that um, well, the humanities don't have anything to tell us about uh, current, our current situation and that, you know, it's really only scientists and, and uh, medical professionals who can help us think through this. And I think one of the things that um, really strikes me about Sari's work is that it helps illustrate the way that humanity scholarship is helpful for thinking about public health issues, um, especially a scholarship on the early American period. So a lot of what we know about epidemics and public health in the United States comes from experiences that happened in the period that the Clements Collections covers from the 1793 yellow fever epidemic in Philadelphia to the cholera outbreaks in the mid 19th century uh, to the diseases that devastated uh, soldiers camps during the Civil War. Much of what we know about public health and contagion in this country comes from the period that the Clements Collections covers. Um, and so humanity scholarship is really useful, first of all, for just telling us that we have been through experiences like this before. Um, but even more importantly, I think uh, humanity scholarship and especially literary scholarship can show us that there are other ways of knowing uh, about medicine and health. And that um, thinking only in the empirical scientific mode doesn't give us a full picture of how people experience things like this. Thanks, Paul. Sure. Uh, I'd love to hear more about the article now. Sure. Um, so uh, the article is, as I said, is drawn from, from Sari's book. Um, and it's about, um, Gothic literature and specifically the cholera epidemics of the mid 19th century. And it starts out with the famous, if you know any stories about the history of epidemiology, you probably have heard this story about Jon Snow, who was a doctor in London. Um, in the mid 1850s, there was a cholera outbreak and, and just through mapping where cholera cases happened, he didn't understand germ theory, he didn't really understand how cholera spread, but he did a map of one of the neighborhoods in London that was hardest hit by cholera. And he showed that there was a concentration of cases around a specific water pump. Um, and his theory was that it was, the, the pump was somehow connected to how people were getting cholera. And he thought if they took the pump out, it would help, the, uh, help address the epidemic. Um, so they took the water pump away, the cholera outbreak subsided, uh, and to this day, the award for achievement in applied epidemiology is called the Pump Handle Award after this famous story. Um, and so it's this kind of triumph of empirical knowledge uh, in addressing disease. You, you plot cases on a map, you show where people are getting sick, uh, and that's how you address the crisis. Um, and what the article does is talk about a different way that people talked about cholera in the 19th century, which was through the lens of Gothic literature. Um, so most of you are probably familiar with Gothic through the stories of Edgar Allan Poe. Think of uh, The Fall of the House of Usher or The Mask of the Red Death, um, which is a fantastic and terrifying story. And I really recommend people uh, read it again if you haven't read it in a long time. But the Gothic is a literary mode that's, that's about terror and the uncanny. It's about um, uh, how dark unseen forces infiltrate familiar environments. Um, so it's different from horror, uh, it's different from fairy tales. It's really around this, cultivating this atmosphere of dread, which was perfectly suited to writing about cholera. It was a disease that 
people didn't understand how it spread. They didn't know where it came from. And uh, the, the really terrifying thing about cholera was how fast it killed people. Um, people who got cholera would sometimes be dead within hours. Um, and the mortality rate in the mid 19th century was often close to 50%. Doctors had no way of uh, treating people who got cholera and couldn't explain where it came from. And so it was this really frightening unknown force um, that uh, because of the way things that had happened in the 19th century around urbanization and transportation and communication, people could get information about in new ways. Um, and the Gothic emerged as, as a way of talking about it. It was really well suited to narrating people's experience of the disease. And so the article draws out really wonderfully, I think, the specific ways that the Gothic was a way that people knew about cholera and, and the way, a way that they knew about public health um, and it shaped how they acted. Um, so it's not just this, that this was a form of fiction that people enjoyed, but that it actually shaped what people did in real life. Um, it also had some negative effects because it um, it drove people to look for an outside force um, that was responsible for spreading the disease, which uh, then as now we're seeing is often a racial other. So it's um, blaming an outside group for the spread of the disease. Um, but I will stop there. Uh, I'm happy to send the PDF to anybody who'd like to read it um, and look forward to the discussion. Thanks, Paul. People are very interested in the PDF and the title of the article. So maybe once um, we're finished, you can type that into the Q&A. Sure. And we also, everyone, are happy to send out after this discussion um, the PDF and some links and some other information via email to all of you. So sure. that was part of the reason why we had you all register so that we would be able to follow up as needed. Um, any other specific questions for uh, Paul at this time, if you want to type them in? And I would just say that the, the title of the article is The Gothic Origins of Global Health, um, but I'm happy to send the PDF to everyone who's registered. Great, right. thank you so much. Yep. And I realized that I forgot to mention that we talked about having some themes for this uh, Clements Bookworm, and today's theme is what we're reading now. So we have quite a variety. So thank you, Paul, for that um, first one. Next up, we have Sarah Kwashny. She works as an information resource assistant in the Clements Library, both with Reader Services and with the Manuscripts Division. Welcome, Sarah. What are you sharing today? Um, so I am currently reading a work of fiction. Um, it actually is supposed to be our book club selection for April, but unfortunately we won't be meeting um, until probably May. Um, but it's called The Women of the Copper Country, um, a novel by Mary Doria Russell. Um, and it follows, well, it's based on the real life of Annie Clements, um, who was a young woman um, born into a Slovenian immigrant family up in Calumet, Michigan. Um, in 19, and in 1913, um, she sort of catalyzed and helped uh, spearhead this uh, strike of copper miners up in Calumet. Um, against a number of the copper mining companies, uh, the largest and most profitable uh, was the Calumet and Hecla Mining Company. Um, so the book covers the period of June 1913 when the strike begins, um, and I believe it goes until the end of December 1913, and I kind of peeked at the section title, but I didn't want to get any spoilers. Um, and it follows mainly her, but also other prominent characters, um, during the strike. Um, so James McNaughton, the owner of Calma and Hecla, um, he features kind of getting to see what his uh, thinking is behind the running of his company um, and the demands of the miners and their families, um, as well as um, also talking about uh, Charles Miller is the character in the book. I believe his actual name was Charles Moyer. He was an outside um, union representative who would travel amongst the different chapters of the Western Federation of Miners to help lead strikes at this time.
So um, what, what aspects of this book have you connected with personally? Um, so I guess first the book has been really interesting just in terms of looking at all the different facets of this particular strike. Um, so learning about more about the history of the Upper Peninsula and its mining history. Um, I have family connections up there um, on the western side of the peninsula. My grandma's family, um, going back, her mother and her mother's mother, um, were part of an iron mining family um, in Iron County, Stambo and Iron River. Um, so I, they had a cottage up north we used to visit in the summers and a great little historical museum that I learned a lot about the history of that county up there, but not as much about um, the copper mining, which was probably the most lucrative business at one point up there. Um, and also learning more about just sort of um, these figures that um, come up in terms of labor history as well as women's history. Um, so it's set in 1913, you're sort of seeing the emergence of this um, union movement organization. Um, they talk about sort of how the mining company workers just think of them as a bunch of Marxists and the workers think, you know, compare them to the Russian empire. Um, but you're also looking at uh, the rise of women becoming prominent in organized movements too. Um, there's a lot of hearkening back to the Lawrence Mill workers, Bread and Roses strike, which was a few years previous. Um, and women led that too. Um, in this book, it's a lot of any sort of bringing together these diverse groups um, from various immigrant backgrounds um, and bringing them together under the idea that they don't want any more deaths um, in their families and how women have to deal with that and also take care of the household and they don't want to live that life anymore. Um, so it's it's been a really interesting look at both a more local history but then broader context to the history too. Wow, thanks. Um, so this seems like a book where we might have some materials at the Clements relating to this time period. Uh, do you know about any materials that we have? Yes. Um, so I did a little digging, uh, which is one of the favorite, my favorite parts of my job, actually. Um, and so uh, the most directly connected one is the David Tinder collection of Michigan photography in the county files. Um, we do have photographs from Houghton County. Um, I was talking to Clayton Lewis, our graphics curator, yesterday um, when we were sort of doing previews of our books, um, and he mentioned that there's some great material on the strike and the Italian hole disaster, which I have not yet reached in the book. I kind of have a feeling it's the climactic finale, um, so I don't know much about it yet, but he did say there is some pretty um, graphic material um, in our photograph collection. Um, and then I also did some quick digging this morning. Um, in terms of copper mining in the Upper Peninsula, the Edward H. Thompson papers. Um, he was a gentleman who worked with uh, Dr. Houghton in terms of setting up copper mining um, and uh, kind of surveying mineral deposits in the Upper Peninsula in the first half of the 19th century. Um, so Calumet, the town, wasn't founded until the mid-1860s. Um, but they were sort of laying the groundwork uh, for these larger mining companies that came later. Okay, thanks. Thanks so much for that. We have um, a couple of questions, sure. and I don't know if you'll know the answer to this one, but um, we have a question. Is the author of the book a uh, professional historian? Um, so I don't believe so. Let me see. She has a PhD in biological anthropology. Um, but I know uh, one of the other members of my book club is a big fan of other books of hers. I think she does specialize in historical fiction now. Um, you know, looking through kind of her notes in the back and she did do research in at the uh, Michigan Tech University archives. Um, they have a lot of material related to the local history of Houghton County. Um, but it, it seems like she delved into that as sort of a second career. <laughs> Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, thanks, Sarah. That was wonderful. Our next presenter is Richard Marsh, and he is a member of the Clemens Library Associates Board of Governors. And um, Dick, uh, what book will you be talking about today? Uh, I read last week the Splendid and the Vile 
a saga of Churchill, family, and defiance during the Blitz. And I chose this particular book because I'm the uh, longtime president of the Winston Churchill Society of Michigan. I tried to read uh, all the new books that are written about Churchill and his era. So that's how I decided to read the book. Great, uh, thank you so much. Tell us more about the it. Book. It's yeah, uh, Eric Larson is the author and he is a terrific author. Uh, this is his sixth national bestseller and this particular book uh, just came out and was published three weeks ago. It's already shot to the top of the New York Times nonfiction bestseller list. Uh, I had read one of Larson's books before. It was uh, In the Garden of Beasts, which dealt with uh, William Dodd, the US ambassador to Nazi Germany in the 1930s. Uh, the Splendid and the Vile covers the first year of Winston Churchill's premiership from May 1940 to May 1941. It's the period of the Blitz when the Luftwaffe mercilessly bombed Great Britain and particularly London in the hope that the Brits would surrender or at the least that the Royal Air Force would be knocked out of the skies leading to a German invasion. Of course, the RAF was not knocked out of the skies, uh, resulting in Win Winston's famous compliment to the RAF. Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so few to so many. The book is very chronological going from day to day through this year. Although most of the book concentrates on London, it also flips back and forth to Berlin primarily using for read. I particularly enjoyed the interplay between Winston and Max Aitken, Lord Beaverbrook. He, uh, Winston made him the Minister of Aircraft Production, which was a very He, he was formerly, he was a press lord, very influential in politics. But Max would resign from his position every few weeks. Winston would then cajole and compliment him, play to his ego, and then firmly refuse to accept his resignation. Winston considered Beaverbrook to be a good friend, although they had their ups and downs. Clementine Churchill, Winston's wife, did not trust Beaverbrook. She suspected that Beaverbrook wanted to replace Winston as prime minister. She wrote to Winston, my darling, try ridding yourself of this microbe, which some people fear is in your blood. Exorcise this bottle imp and see the air is not clearer and purer. Winston could only respond by succinctly summarizing his relationship with Max. He said, some people take drugs, I take Max. Larson makes great use of diaries. One of the great diaries of the period was John Jock Colville, who was Winston's young private secretary and confidant. Uh, Colville had been private secretary to Neville Chamberlain before Winston. In fact, Colville was very upset. Didn't much approve Winston at that time, but that he became one of Winston's first admirers. It's interesting to note that under the British Official Secrets Act, it was highly illegal at the time for somebody in Colville's position to, to keep a diary. I'm sure he had the Germans successfully invaded Great Britain that Hitler would have loved to get his hands on Colville's diary. I enjoyed the fact that Larson used Colville's diary to deal with some of Colville's personal life, including his unsuccessful courtship of Gabe Margeson. He comes across in his diary entries as a lovesick boy. He was only 25 years old at the time. Gabe Margeson was the daughter of David Margeson, the Conservative Party whip 
during the 1930s. It's the job of the whip, as that name would imply, to make conservatives, conservative MPs fall into line behind the policies of the conservative governments of Stanley Baldwin and Neville Chamberlain. Winston was the leading anti-appeaser in the 1930s, opposing his own government's positions with regard to Nazi Germany. Winston and David Margeson had many nasty confrontations during the 1930s. The diary entries that I enjoyed the most were from the diary of Mary Churchill, Winston and Clementine's youngest child, who later became Lady Soames. She died six years ago uh, at the ripe old age of 91. I believe that Eric Larson was the first person that was allowed to use Mary Soames' diaries in his book. Uh, he was given permission to quote from the diaries by Emma Soames, Mary's daughter. Larry, uh, Lady Soames used her diaries in the preparation of her autobiography, A Daughter's Tale, which was published in September 2011. My wife and I were very privileged to attend Lady Soames' 89th birthday party on September 15, 2011 at Cannes on the French Riviera. Every guest at the party received a beautiful copy of the uh, Daughter's Tale personally inscribed by Lady Soames. And I don't know if you can see what is right behind me, but it's a bookcase. And there's about 60 books in this particular bookcase. All of them were formerly owned by Lady Soames. I read with interest in Larson's book about Mary's first love, Eric Lord Duncannon. Mary was 18 years old at the time, and I think somewhat immature for even that age. Eric proposed marriage and Mary accepted. The engagement was to be formally announced on a Monday and the family was at Checkers, the Prime Minister's country retreat, the prior weekend. Clementine Churchill violently opposed the engagement because of Mary's youth and inexperience. She asked Averill Harriman to take a walk in the garden at Checkers with Mary to try and dissuade her. FDR had sent Harriman to England to coordinate the Lend-Lease program. Mary actually came to her senses and the engagement was broken. She ultimately married Christopher Soames eight years later. It is ironic and almost unbelievable that when Averill Harriman was giving fatherly advice to Mary in that checkers garden, and he was 49 years old at the time, that at that very same time, he was having an affair with Mary's 21-year-old sister-in-law, who was married to Winston's only son, Randolph. Now, Larson very tactfully handles the situation, the scene where Harriman first vetted Pamela Churchill. It occurred at the Dorchester Hotel in the middle of an air raid. Pamela Digby Churchill Hayward Harriman, using all her married name, ultimately married to Joe Harriman in 1971. I personally consider her to be the greatest courtesan of the 20th century. The book also covers what I consider the most difficult wartime decision that Winston ever had to make. The Germans had overran France. Winston was very concerned that what would happen to the French Navy if it was combined with the German Navy, it would be far superior to the Navy of Great Britain. Certain French warships were in North African ports. The British Navy gave the French an ultimatum. Turn over your ships and sail them to British ports. The French ignored the ultimatum. And Winston ordered the admiral in charge only one month into Winston's premiership to attack the French vessels. The Battle of Mers el Kabir occurred, although that was really a misnomer to call it a battle. The French ships were defenseless in port, and in fact, 1,297 French officers and sailors were killed, countless number of others were maimed, and the British incurred no casualties. 
When Winston spoke in the House of Commons the next day, he was giving a standing ovation. But much more importantly was the reaction of Franklin Roosevelt, who was very impressed with what the Brits had done. The Brits mean business and they would not be surrendering. I think there's an interesting analogy portrayed in the book with our current situation, being cooped up in our houses because of the pandemic. Londoners who took the brunt of the blitz were calm, courageous, and fearless. They went about their daily lives with fortitude. In our case, it is very important that we stay at home. But we should take the lead of the Londoners of 1940 and 41. And I think the phrase that they stayed calm and carried on is very applicable to that time and should be our lead at this difficult time. We will get through this pandemic uh, situation. So I highly recommend The Splendid and the Vile. In addition to being a very entertaining book, I think it is a very uplifting book for this period of time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dick. Um, don't see any specific questions right now. So I am going to, um, let's see. I am going to end our first poll, which we asked about your reading habits and share the results of that. Um, I appreciate everybody letting us know how much you read. I see that a lot of people still enjoy a good old fashioned paper book. And um, as you probably can see behind me, I do as well. Um, our next uh, poll that I would like to share with you is asking you about um, what you would like to see in the future as soon as I figure out how to do that. So let's see. All right. So as you have a chance, I would love to see what topics you might like us to discuss in the future and whether or not you would be willing to be a panelist in the future. We're already a couple of moments over time, but we would love to have you uh, continue chatting online for as long as you would like and ask some more questions and also complete that poll. In addition, I'd like to um, thank all of our panelists today and I'm going to unmute them and just see if they would like to um, say, say anything before we sign off today. Any comments? I just have a question for, for Dick, actually. Dick, how much of the research in this book is based on materials that people haven't used before? I know you mentioned that the author had, um, was one of the first people to get access to, to one of the diaries, but how much of the other material hasn't been used? I think he's muted, Angela. I'm trying to unmute him now, but I think he is also having a little bit of a bandwidth issue. Oh, okay. I can ask him offline, that's fine. Okay, well, thank you. All right then, so, I hope that you will uh, join us next week. Um, we'd love to have you uh, continue these discussions about the books that we're reading. And uh, thank you very much. Bye everybody. Thanks everyone.